All right, good morning, everyone. So uh, this session is your digital media toolbox, a faculty guide to using educational audio and video. Um, a lot of you may know me. My name is Brian O'Hagan. And uh, through, uh, uh, I get to work with a great staff of educational technologists, technical specialists, and video specialists in uh, developing uh, media services and media platform initiatives through CCNMTL, uh, all, all in the hopes of providing great services for people on campus. So uh, on behalf of that team, I'd like to talk about uh, a lot of the efforts that we've been pushing forward here on campus for the last two to three years. And we're gonna, we're gonna cover a lot of content today. Uh, the, we're gonna talk about media platforms. We're gonna talk about the technology that you can use to deliver video. But I mean, the real emphasis of this, of this session is gonna be a look at content. We're gonna be looking at the types of content that people are producing here on campus in relation to their courses uh, using audio and video. And what I wanted to really start off with is, is this. This is our mission statement. And I think as you move through the sessions today at the conference, you're gonna see a, a lot of flavors of CC and MTL. And we do so many things. And we, we are really here because we're interested in how you teach really interested in how you can do it better with technology. So this is kind of our core, right? This is what we do. This is what we're here to do. But the emphasis here is, is this, faculty as content experts. Whatever we do, we really value the time that we spend with instructors in creating materials that are used by students. We really value that time and we value those approaches. So this session, although we're gonna be talking about a lot of technology that you can use to make audio and video easier in your course, it really comes down to this. So what I wanna introduce is kind of our framework for the conversation. We're gonna be here for about an hour. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of really cool uh, uh, subjects, at least that's really biased, right? That's my opinion. Um, but I'm also gonna be showing a lot of cool examples, a lot of cool examples of what people on campus are actually doing using audio and video in their course. So we're gonna start with media platforms and services. Uh, these are gonna be the technologies that drive our services for, for media production. We're gonna talk about iTunes U and YouTube EDU, which are really public platforms for delivering educational content, not just to students, but to the world. Then we're gonna talk about services that CC and MTL has been developing to make uh, audio and video experiences easier in your course websites, in your course blogs and in your course wikis. Then in that top section, it's gonna be scattered with a lot of, a lot of examples of, of how this stuff is being used. So then we're gonna actually switch into a content phase because I really wanna talk about the two most popular types of content that are produced in academic settings, especially, especially with video. And that's lecture recordings, which is just the amount of lecture recordings that are being produced and distributed these days just skyrocketed. So we're gonna talk about what those are and some suggested tools that you can use to produce your own. Because again, we're really, we really wanna look at you guys or educators as the content experts and the producers. And then we're gonna talk about course-related video. And this is a very wide spectrum. These are YouTube videos that you wanna show in your course. These are VHS and DVD uh, uh, tape or you know VHS tapes DVDs that you have footage that you want to kind of get to your class somehow and you'd like to get them online you want to share them but how do you do that so we're going to talk a lot about that and we're going to break those down as far as resources uh, educational technologists who are really the people who that we have on our staff to help you and we're going to talk about our faculty support lab which is a whole lab available for you guys in Butler library where you can come in you can use all sorts of tools so we're gonna get started with iTunes U. Who here has uh, visited the Columbia iTunes U site by chance? Right. Who here has visited iTunes U? All right, so a lot of people then are familiar with the iTunes application. Uh, it's probably become the most popular media player today. It's available on Mac and Windows. And uh, it's produced by Apple Computer. And Apple is really using iTunes to distribute all sorts of content. I think now they just broke into the ebook market. They've been doing movies for a while. They've been doing music forever now. I mean, they basically revolutionized the way that music's being done. I'm not an Apple representative, by the way. <laughs> you know, you know. But I, I really love this stuff. And what I really like about iTunes U is it's Apple's portal for educational content. 
And there are over 800 uh, academic institutions using iTunes U today. And Columbia is just one of them. And we've seen tremendous growth in this, with this platform. We started this as a service for faculty three years ago. And our focus is really providing a space where educators can distribute academic content. And what it's become is this place where anyone on campus can distribute media easily. It's, it's organized behind the podcasting model, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about in the content phase. But what it basically does is it syndicates media collections to people. You can subscribe to them. It's a syndication model. So you can host files on iTunes U, and students or anyone can subscribe to your collections. And whenever you put new materials up there, you automatic, your, your, your viewers will automatically receive the update. So it's, it's really changed the way that media is being shared, especially audio and video. And in academic settings, this is just skyrocketed again. These are just some brief numbers. And we collected these after our, uh, I believe our, right after this past academic year. So we've just seen tremendous growth. And we have a lot of people accessing this stuff, especially now since you can access this portal on many mobile devices. iPhones, iPod Touch, iPads. You can download this stuff automatically. So what I want to show you is a typical course collection. And in iTunes U, you have the ability to create a collection for your course. And in this course collection, you can organize all sorts of different media materials. It supports audio files, it supports video files, it even supports PDFs. So it enables you to have a space on the web where students can reference the stuff easily on mobile devices or on their desktop machines. What I want to show you is kind of a brief tour of the iTunes U site for those of you who haven't seen it. So at the top of the page, we have About Columbia. This is really a section where we organize content uh, from things that are happening all over the university. So there are a lot of events materials in here. We have walking tours. We have uh, special events. We have Columbian news. So whenever someone visits iTunes U, they can hit this top level and they can see what's happening on campus right from the get-go. Courses and Academic Podcast is really the core of this service. And this is where we house all of our academic recordings. Lots of audio, now a tremendous amount of video. A lot of the materials, though, here are only available to Columbia students or to people on campus. One of the benefits of the iTunes U service is where it's a platform for the world to access, we can also make sure that content is only available to students if, they, if that's your case. If you have sensitive materials and you don't want the world to see it, we can make sure only your students can see it. But the area that is really seen and also, uh, or that's also seen a, a great amount of growth is, is this. We have se sections that are dedicated to schools and departments. This is where schools can get their own space on iTunes U and host promotional materials, student profiles. They can use it for fundraising. There's all sorts of ways that you can use this. And just this past year, we've broken out to centers and institutes. So these are groups that maybe aren't affiliated with a school or not affiliated with a particular department but they also are a part of the campus community, and they need a place where they want to promote their material. So this has also become a really sensational uh, uh, distribution platform. So what I want to show you is, uh, is an example of how iTunes U is being used on campus. There are, we have a wide range of examples. We have lots of instructors who are creating their own course recordings and uploading them to iTunes U for their students. Uh, uptown at the medical campus, there's a, a, a widespread effort to do course capture, where many courses are recorded and distributed, and all the students are getting that content through iTunes U. But then we also have cases that really get at the topic of the session, which is about you, faculty or instructors, being the content experts and trying to work with students to have them use audio and video material, uh, material in interesting ways. And we had a great example from last year in Masterpieces of Western Art. Now, Justin Conrad was an instructor for uh, Western, Masterpieces of Western Art last year. And she used iTunes U as a place for her students to create multimedia essays in relation to the course. Now, Masterpieces of Western Art is a core course. 
I think just every, about any, uh, I think every undergraduate Columbia student has to take it. No matter your, if you're Columbia College, C's, or GS, you've got to go through it. So Jessamine put together this course collection. We opened up access so that students could upload materials to this collection. And I want to read just a, a selection of Jessamine's description. Students were asked to analyze a piece by an artist we study in the class, or choose a work by a different artist to relate that object to an image, uh, to a unit from the course. Now, this is part of the standard curriculum of the course. In Masterpieces of Western Art, uh, uh, students are usually asked to write an essay or some kind of project where they kind of go into detail about a specific work of art. But what's really great here is that Jessamine had her students do this with audio and video. So not only are you seeing the work, but you're hearing their reflections. And what I want to show you is one example, which and I was talking with Jessamine about this. She's here, and after I show this example, she's going to share a little bit about the experience with you and why she chose to do this, was that there are so many great examples. But this is just one of them. So I'd welcome you to check this out after the session. In a small hallway off of what was once Henry Clay Frick's living room hangs Pierre-Auguste Renoir's mother and children. Measuring 67 inches by 42 and 5 eighths inches, this intimate and candid oil on canvas shows a young woman guiding two impeccably dressed and maybe well-behaved girls down a park path. Although the subjects of the portrait have never been identified, according to a tradition there were two daughters of an affluent Parisian family and their nurse who Renoir encountered in a park. The painting exhibits many of the characteristics of a prototypical Impressionist painting. The subject is an ordinary family, painted in an open composition with visible brushstrokes. There's an emphasis on movement and light that was, in 1878 when Renoir painted Mother and Children, unique to the Impressionist movement. So why is this work, which represented the most vibrant and new techniques in painting, included in a museum primarily known for its preeminent collection of high-quality old master paintings and fine furniture? How does Renoir's composition, with its almost casual experiments in light, fit into the greater Frick collection? It's an open-ended question. I guess we can think about that. Uh, but this is really fantastic. This was produced by Columbia undergraduate students. This is really great. So if, uh, if I may, I want to invite Jessamine up just to say a few words about this process. Hi. Um, it's, it's fun for me to see these again because I, I've totally watched them like six times and I love them. I, I was blown away by how well students did by this stuff. Um, Brian sort of asked me to, to mention two things, which is why I did this and then what happened. And the reason that I did it is, first of all, I really like doing sort of creative activities other than just asking kids to write essays. I find that they respond to it well. Um, with Art Hum, you know, I thought about what is the point of this course? These kids are not going to be art historians. They're going to go out into the world and they're going to go to museums sometimes and they're going to sit next to their law firm partner at a company dinner and the guy's going to say, oh yeah, I'm sort of, you know, into Rothko. I'm thinking about buying a new one, you know. <laughs> and, and well, I mean, seriously, right? I mean, this is the experience that people are going to have and, and we're asking them to be versed in this um, humanities world. And the thing that Art Hum actually does, for those of you who don't know, it's actually not an art history course. It's a visual analysis course. The idea is to give people the tools to analyze anything visually. Um, so what I decided to do was I felt like going someplace and actually talking about something and analyzing it, almost giving a tour of it, was much more um, in line with what students will actually be doing with art in their future. And that's sort of where this came out of. And um, <clears throat> I actually didn't give kids much guidance, I have to say. I made them learn how to use the technology themselves using um, Linda, was it Linda? Linda? Linda, which is this amazing resource that we have access to at Columbia that basically can teach you how to do anything on computers. Um, and uh, the people in, in CC and MTL helped me understand how to do it, like I learned a little bit so I knew that they were capable of doing it, the kids. And um, I was just blown away. I mean, the, the stuff, I mean, you can see this is, you know, this girl is 19 years old or something and she figured out how to do this in a way that looks to me, you know, professional, like this could be on TV. 
Um, and I think that my experience with it was, first of all, that the quality was really good. Second of all, having something that's distributed publicly gives kids an incentive to do something really well because it, it occurs to them that their peers will see this. It also gives them something that they can show their parents. You know, like they go home at Thanksgiving and they show their parents this thing that they did and they're proud of it. And it also teaches them transferable skills, which I think is really important because they're not all gonna be art historians. But you know, now all of the students who took my course know how to use um, iTunes, they know how to upload something, they know how to use GarageBand, they know how to make a podcast. I mean, it just forces them to learn some skills. And, and they, they do respond really well. Um, and I found that it was one of the most successful things I've done in, in my teaching. Uh, and I'm actually a Lit Hum instructor now, and I'm trying to determine um, something like this that I can do with, with Lit Hum. And, you know, I just, I encourage you to use the office because these guys are amazing. They're so helpful. They're really good at talking to people like me who know nothing about any of this technology and <laughs> not making you feel stupid. And, uh, and, and you can get some really, really cool stuff that's creative and interesting. And students step up to the challenge, I found, and are proud of themselves for having done it. Yeah, so that was my experience. Thank you. Yeah. I want, and thank you for coming by. Thanks for thanks for saying that. I I mean I I yeah. So that in a nutshell is iTunes U, uh, and there's tons more content there. You can go to iTunes U. You can log in with your own uni and see all the content that's there. What I want to do now is transition to YouTube. So last year, we extended this media platform initiative service to incorporate YouTube. Now. YouTube is primarily video. And uh, whereas iTunes U, I think, began to support this podcasting model, it really grew into online video sharing. And the way that people are now looking to YouTube and online video sharing sites as primary places to, to learn about all kinds of stuff. So YouTube EDU is YouTube's educational portal. It now collects, I believe, over 300 uh, channels from universities and academic institutions. Uh, and up there, you'll find a wide range of, of things. You'll see course lectures. You'll see special events. You'll see guest speakers. And at Columbia, we've tried to replicate the same successful model of YouTube channels that are being produced by other universities. So we started with adding lots of conference and events materials. And again, we're working with faculty who want to put up publicly available course materials. And this is, I'd say of the platforms, YouTube is the riskier option because it's really out there for the world to see. It gets at this whole peer viewing aspect that Jessman really referred to. And there are some people who want to try that and there are some people who are thinking about it and then for some people it's not the right thing. But this is a platform that's out there for anyone on campus to use. And these are, again, some brief stats on the channel. In just one year, we've grown to include 400 academic videos, right? They're actively shared everywhere. What's really amazing is we worked in coordination with three different departments on campus in May to get all of the commencement materials up on YouTube EDU. Within the first month after all those clips were posted, we had over 640,000 views. This is really where the world is looking to see what's happening on our campus. And what's even, what's even more critical is that they're all available on these. In July, uh, YouTube created a new mobile portal that's much easier for people to use on mobile devices. Does anybody have an iPhone, iPad, Android phone? Keep <coughs> Keep those handy because there's a, there's, a, there's a fun uh, game coming up in 15 minutes. But that was a good time to ask it, I guess. Um, YouTube highlighted Meryl Streep's speech to uh, Barnard graduates. Uh, I guess she spoke on one of the commencement days. In one week, there were 150,000 views on mobile devices alone. That's not even counting the web. That's not even counting the web is what we think about it, right? So this has really become, again, an extraordinary place for you to publish video materials. I'd like to hold questions to the end of 
this session, if that's okay. Thank you. So there are instructors who are out there thinking about how they want to use YouTube as a course resource. And there are many instructors at other universities who are posting publicly available lectures. And the first one to be posted here at Columbia is by Professor Richard Bullitt. Now, Professor Bullitt actually started recording lectures, I think about three or four years ago. And he initially started using the iTunes U service, great way to distribute the content to his students. But it's really important for Richard that his content is available to as many people as he wants. And that it should be available for the world to, uh, to access. So Richard is now publishing his entire course from this semester on YouTube EDU. It's been done through the help of his TA. His, through, uh, through his TA, Richard came to us. We helped uh, recommend guidelines. I think we even had like a little boot camp. Again, because we really want to look at Richard and his course as the content expert for this. And they're producing it twice a week. They automatically upload it to the channel, and it's available to the world. Um, what I want to do is, uh, is invite Richard Bullitt up to say a few words about this. He's actually here today. And uh, he's going to talk just, just briefly about why he decided to do this. OK, thank you very much. Um, there must be a flat surface here. Ah, there's a flat surface. All right, uh, the lectures that I've been giving are in a course on the history of the world. It is intended to be a two semester course, though for personal reasons it'll probably be split between this semester and next fall. And it is a course that is meant to deconstruct the concept of world history by assigning students to read a standard world history textbook chapter every week and then giving lectures tearing the chapter apart. I wrote the textbook. So I feel uh, completely at ease in telling students what a, what a bunch of crap it is. Uh, but even more in making them aware of um, why America does world history when nobody else in the world does, uh, where this came from, what, it, uh, what role the concept of world history uh, plays in our culture, and um, uh, just show them the, you know, of course you can't know world history, but show them the many different ways and uh, opportunities that that rubric opens. So I decided that I would uh, put them all, uh, make them all publicly available, and uh, one reason for this is that I'm retiring. So I don't have to worry about next year's course superseding this year's course. The same thing with the two courses I, uh, for which uh, audio uh, files of my uh, lectures are available. They were the last times I was going to teach those courses on history of the modern Middle East and history of Iran. And um, I think it does make a difference where uh, where you are in your career in terms of uh, what you want to make available. Uh, in the past, I always had a certain ambivalence about the idea of recording because uh, my courses would be refreshed each year one way or another, and I didn't particularly want to have an early iteration become the, the, the permanent statement. But other people would help, may have much more stable courses and much more um, uh, kind of standardized content. And now making a public, uh, as if any of you watches any of these lectures, uh, what you'll find is I don't write lectures, I don't use notes. I walk in, look at the class, figure out what the course is, and simply talk. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a little more complicated than that. But it, um, it puts an emphasis on, uh, on improvisation. Uh, to some degree on theater, and, uh, and I like that. It's not for every personality, probably, but, um, but I like it, and I like the fact that it is publicly available. I, a number of years ago, did a mini course for Fathom.com, if any of you was around when we had that uh, internet boondoggle. 
Um, but there, I kept thinking, uh, a publicly available course, I'd better make it uh, consumable by the general public. And I found that I was simplifying things. But here I'm not. I'm, giving a, I'm, I'm having a, a real Columbia course for Columbia students. Uh, and um, if other people find value in it, that's fine. But I think it's important not to, to think of these public things as a dumbing down or a generalization or a uh, stretching uh, the, the notion of Columbia content to reach audiences that we would not normally admit to our, to our classes. Uh, let the viewers uh, trade up rather than the uh, producers uh, trading down. Uh, one final comment. Uh, one of my views in doing this was um, sort of archiving my time at Columbia. Uh, frankly, I think whether it's publicly available or whether it is simply for, uh, for the Columbia archives, I think retiring professors should be should have video archives. But we're not in, you know, we, we leave our, our papers to the rare book room where they're cataloged and then, you know, 50 years later some poor sod comes and, you know, tries to, uh, you know, figure out what we were thinking. But uh, I think video archives are, uh, are way more than simply uh, vehicles for content. They really say something about, um, what Columbia is, what, uh, what professors do. Um, having a lavalier microphone on wireless mic and having an itty bitty camera off on the side is no distraction at all, for me at least. I, I never particularly think of the fact that it is being recorded. Uh, if I make a, uh, a fool of myself, as I do from time to time, if I'm willing to make a fool of myself for Columbia students, why not for the whole world? Uh, it, it simply doesn't make that much, uh, that much difference. And my own guess is, and this is partly responding, uh, looking at some of the comments that have been made, um, I think if we had 20 professors who made lecture courses available online, that would, we would see a significant number of applicants to Columbia College and Columbia Graduate School. Uh, this is not something where people think, oh, I can get a Columbia course uh, for free because watching lectures is not the same thing as taking a course. And instead of uh, making people think they're getting something that, uh, that is a, a, a substitute for coming to Columbia, I think they're, they become excited by the idea that this is what is done at an elite university. Uh, and it, in that respect, I think it's more desirable because of the Columbia, a specific Columbia connection, to have it this way than to have some sort of commercial great lecturers series that cherry picks uh, professors from here and there. And I think that this should become a, uh, a common thing uh, at Columbia. And I hope other people will either have the, uh, uh, the lack of uh, self-critical sense or whatever it takes to, uh, to, to do this sort of thing. The first lecture in this series um, has had now uh, 829 uh, visitors. I asked my students how many of them look at the lectures online. Virtually everyone in the class does. Now, in, and, and then I said, how many of you uh, skip a class and just look at the lecture online. And the student said, you're asking the wrong people, we're here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and, it and, and it clearly has eroded class attendance. And frankly, I don't care. If they see, the, see it on video uh, at their convenience, uh, I'd rather have them do that than come in and fall asleep or uh, be distracted in some way. And the fact that they can go back and look at the lectures uh, when it comes to, um, to any sort of, of evaluation or appraisal of the course, they don't have to rely on their notes, given the decline of English writing. Their notes probably aren't very good. 
uh, but they can see uh, that, they, that they can see the real thing. So I think it's it's valuable for the enrolled students. I think it's valuable for Columbia. I think it's valuable for the general public, and I particularly think that it's um, valuable for people in my age cohort who have a possibility of leaving a trace at this university. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so that's, that's Columbia on YouTube. You can go there, youtube.com slash Columbia. Uh, this is a look at Richard's course, but there's tons of content up there. I think last month we just put up all of the uh, World Leaders events. So uh, those have, uh, again, tremendously popular. You can go check it out. Um, so in a nutshell, th those are the public media platforms. And this is really uh, where the world is coming to see what's, what we're doing. And uh, you know, we're, we're trying to take a very serious look at how these platforms can be used for educational reasons, but also so that enriches the public. Uh, it's open 24-7, so stop on by. Um, I want to transition now to media services for your course. Um, I want to say that the majority of the requests that we get as an organization, uh, some of them are for lecture recordings, but the majority of them are for other things. How do I get a YouTube video into my courseworks? I've got that, this DVD and I want to share it with my students. How can I get it up, on, uh, up online? And we, I, I've asked our staff, and we kind of estimate that about 75% of our media production requests are for that, for previously existing materials that, that instructors want to make available online. Now the thing is that iTunes and YouTube isn't for everybody. And if you want to offer a three minute clip from a television program, can't really put it up on the Columbia YouTube channel, right? Or you can't really put it up on iTunes U. You get into all sorts of concerns around copyright and ownership. But we're big supporters that you should be able to use this in the classroom. You should be able to make these things available to your students so that they can use it in their coursework. So what we tried to think about was how can we, as, a, as an organization who provides services for faculty, how can we provide an experience in a course website or a course wiki or a course blog with the same level of convenience as YouTube. And that's what we've been working on for the last year. And this year, or excuse me, this term rather, we've introduced uh, upgraded video support in all these course environments. So that for those instructors who need to provide course related video materials that can't be available to everybody, we can provide them, the students, in the same easy fashion. Click to play video, video that will just work, right? So this is what it looks like in coursework. But what does this do? One, it has built in authentication. So if this video here is embedded in courseworks, it's only gonna work when a student views it in courseworks. If someone were to actually be really uh, ingenious and, and kind of look at the source code of the web browser and find all the, you know, the embed objects and pull it over and try to pull it out. Uh, even if they were to do that, we have a system that recognizes that. So if you take anything from within this page and bring it anywhere else, it prompts you in the video player for Columbia Uni. And if you don't have that Uni, you don't see it. Now there's also an opt-in to public, which means that if you want to make this video available publicly, you can do that. But again, that's something that we can configure. And this is also uh, customizable. If you need playlists, or if you need to create chapters in the video, that's a possibility as well. What this video player is using, it's using open source technology. We're trying to look to what our peers are using at other universities. We wanna see what technologies people are using in different facets. So what we're trying to do with this video player is incorporate uh, things that are openly available so that we can customize them for course situations. So we're using a video player called Flow Player. And more importantly, we're starting to integrate a uh, new technology that's been a buzzword of the last couple of months called HTML5. Well, what does that enable us to do? Well, I'll show you. If you could, I, I asked if you guys had those mobile devices. Why don't you pull these out? If you have an iPhone or an iPod Touch, an Android phone, Actually, let me, uh, did everybody get that link? 
Uh, you could do it on a laptop as well. So any device you have, go ahead and try and load up this bit.ly link. What we're doing with this video player is it has smart recognition. That's very technical, right? Smart, it knows what you're doing. Well, what it knows is where you're trying to play the video, which means that if I'm a student and I wanna watch this on my laptop, it's gonna load it with the appropriate plugin so I can view it on my laptop. But what if I have an iPad? It's going to load it with the appropriate plugin so I can watch that video on my iPad. Now that students have these wide range of devices to watch media, we're trying to make it easier for these types of materials to be viewed in all sorts of different cases. So did everybody get the link? I, see, I hear somebody got it. So where it's gonna take you, is it's gonna take you to this, this page and it's gonna show you a video. Now, on a, web, on a web page, it's going to load in Flash. But if I were to load it on another mobile device, so I've got an iPad here. And if I load up the link, it's actually going to load an iPad compatible video right on the fly. So again, all you have to do is bring us the materials you want to make them available to your students and we can provide the right technology so that no matter where the students try to watch them, they're going to be able to watch these materials not only easily but securely. So that's kind of one of the big selling points of what we're trying to do with this upgraded media platform. And it's still in progress and we're working on a wide range of different options to also include in this video platform, like simplified media production support. We do have a lot of instructors who are recording their own stuff and they want to push it up to courseworks. So we're working on providing simple ways for instructors to publish media to their courseworks or wiki spaces. So this is kind of a schematic of what we're working on. It's a, it's a framework for a workflow where you can upload videos, it's automatically uh, encoded for a web format and that's automatically published into a course environment. And right now we're using a system called Podcast Producer. We're using it in beta. But we're also using some other tools as well. So in the next year, this is kind of where we want to go. We want to integrate the video player with a system like this so it makes it easier, not just for instructors to get audio and video to students, but also for administrators. So that wraps up services. And uh, I think we've seen a few examples of how the, how the technology works, and also, also some examples of content. What I wanna talk about for the last few minutes is content. We're gonna talk about lecture recordings and we're gonna talk about those course-related video projects. So course recordings really became popular with podcasting. Podcasting became this huge boom about six years ago. And what podcast meant was you could move a media file to your iPod. And someone kind of concatenated the words with broadcast and you got podcast, right? Well, I, if you go you know, to the Apple iTunes store, they've, now they've got tons of podcasts like Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me or you know, On the Media. Um, I think everybody and their brother has a podcast these days. But in education, it became extremely popular. And it was looked at, a, at as a way for distributing course recordings. And since that time, many universities have invested a lot of money in what's become course capture technology. This is, this is technology that supports e-classrooms where you can record lectures automatically, they can be scheduled, they're processed, and they're pushed up to places like iTunes U, and they're pushed up to places like YouTube, and they're pushed up to places like Courseworks. So obviously there was a lot of concern that, that Richard kind of alluded to in his talk, that you know, how is this gonna affect attendance, right? And it, it's, it's really been shown that it's not affecting attendance in the way that I think people feared it would when there was this idea that everything would be recorded and archived somewhere for students to access. And, Course recordings come in three different options. I'm gonna try and break them down as easy, easily as possible. There's audio, there's enhanced audio, which is basically audio and slides mixed together in one file, and then there's video. And video comes in two forms. It can either be a screencast, like the Edblogs video that you saw in our HTML5 demo, excuse me, HTML5 demo, or it comes in the form of lecture recordings, like Richard Bullitt's course. And what are they good for? Audio is your entry level. Anyone can record audio these days. If you have a laptop, you can just set up your laptop in your classroom and record your lectures, right? It's the easiest entry point if this is what you want to provide for a student. You can record the, the lecture, 
You can put it up on iTunes or you can put it up on Courseworks and make it available afterwards. A bit harder is if you want to put your presentation materials with the audio. But there's software that enables you to do that. And you can run it on your own laptop. And what are these good for? They're good for you know, those lectures where you really want to include the presentation materials with your, with your audio recording. And most importantly, it makes it reusable. I mean, if you're going to put the effort into recording your course, don't you want to use it again? Wouldn't you want to reuse it next semester? And then there's video. Video is the hardest. Because if you really want to do a screen capture of everything that you see or that you show on a computer screen to your students, you need high quality software to do it. You need microphone to do it on your laptop or a lavalier microphone if you want really good audio. And, but it's also very resource intensive because if you want to produce a video of something that's very complicated, you might have to get a, a, a team of videographers like the ones we have in the back of the room, like trained specialists who know how to help you or at least get you started so you can do it on your own. So here are some basic softwares that you could use to try this out. All of the software I mentioned because we use these. Um, just like I said at the beginning, I'm not an Apple guy, but I'm not here to, to sell you on any of these just because my own personal reasons. I'm showing you these because our staff thinks they're that, that they're reliable. We install these on our machines in our faculty lab. So you could come into our faculty lab and try all these out if you wanted to. But we think that these really work. There's Profcast, which is a great way to record your lecture recordings with your presentations. If you use a lot of PowerPoint, or if you're on a Mac, you use Keynote. This is the easiest way to provide your slides with a recording of your lecture. And you could do it yourself. All you have to do is give the presentation on your laptop, and you're self-guided through the process. It's really as simple as this diagram. You drop your file into the Profcast application, and once your lecture's over, you can choose how you want to distribute it. You could take these files and put it up to YouTube if you wanted to. There's Jing. Jing, you can install on your machine. It's a very small, lightweight application. And you can take screenshots of things that you show on your computer, or you can take full video of things that you can that you show on your computer. And what Jing gives you is a link. And you can take that link and you can plug it right into your coursework site. Or you can put it into a wiki. Camtasia is kind of a sibling to Jing. It's made by the same company. But what Camtasia provides is a set of editorial tools. So if you actually want to take your lecture and, and you kind of like listen back on it and you say to yourself, Jesus, I was really you know, ranting on for five minutes there. I don't really want to send that out to people. You could edit it out and save a new copy. So tools like Camtasia allows you to actually edit your materials and make new copies. And if you're on the Mac, ScreenFlow does the same thing. We use ScreenFlow a lot uh, at CC and MTL to produce all the types of screencasts that we use to promote our projects, like the ones that, like the, the EdBlogs uh, screencast that you saw earlier. It's all produced using ScreenFlow. These are easy. They're, they're cost effective, and we think anyone can learn how to use them, and that's what we're here for. Now, what you make all this content, right? You record your lecture, you're gonna be sending it out to your students, maybe through a podcast or on YouTube. You might wanna think about Creative Commons. Creative Commons gives you options on how you choose or you would like people to use your content. So maybe you don't mind it if your content is remixed or edited you know, you can say that with a Creative Commons license. I say it's okay that you can take my clip and remix it. But what if you're not? You can do that with Creative Commons. You can put a Creative Commons license right on there and says, that says, you can watch this, you can take it, you can share it, but you cannot share it and edit it. So this gives you, you know, some protection in the way that you are distributing this stuff. Creative Commons is, is highly recommended if you're, if you're distributing this stuff to the world. Last but not least, we're going to talk about course-related videos. This really kind of gets at the other, not course-related recordings, but again, those YouTube videos, right? These days, it's very easy for you to do a Google search or a YouTube search and find something that you want to share with students. But the question that we get the most is, well, how did I get it into my course site? It must be pretty complicated. Not really. Uh, we've been working on making our tools a lot easier so that if you want to put YouTube videos, say in a course wiki, you can do so. So here's one of our wikis 
from our Wikispaces service. And you can see, Wikis enables you to put video in there very easily. So this is a comparison of car commercials, right? You can put two YouTube videos in here, have students look at them, have them assess it, reflect on it, write a paper on it. You can use it for further analysis. I think I have a couple more examples here, right? So if anyone's here from the psych department, you know, if you want kids to actually see the films that Albert Vandura produced during his Bobo doll experiments, you know, to really get at what's driving kids, what makes them angry, what kind of phases of anger do they have, they can watch the original materials. They're all available on YouTube. You just plug them right in. But not only that, there are also tools available, like TubeChop, where you can actually cut out pieces of YouTube videos. Maybe you can say, hey, the whole Bandura thing's up there, all 15 minutes of it, but I just want to show these three minutes. You can do that. There are free tools available to you. And you can take those snippets and you can put it into a wiki. So the web is now rich with these resources. And they're easily findable. And the services that we offer support them. So if, that, if you want to add this stuff to your course, you can. Then there's always the VHS, the DVD. You have these materials already. You've had them for years. You want to put them in your course website. But you have to get it into a file format, right? And then once you have it in a file format, you want to get into CourseWorks. Well, we've got the new video player, right? That will help you. But how are they going to use it once it's up there? If you digitize 40 hours of, you know, uh, you know, experimental videos that you've had for, for a long time. You really want to think about how your students are using the materials once they're up there. That brings us back to this. That's what we're here for. Our whole staff of educational technologists can help you think about how they're being used. You come with them with a case study. They can, they can help you think it over. Think about which one of these tools works for you. We also have workshops, a ton of workshops where you can stop in on any subject where you want to learn about these services and learn about how you use audio and video in these services. You can stop by and you can see somebody who looks kind of like me. <laughs> maybe my hair is not as spiky in this picture, but that's, maybe it's my, my twin. Uh, but he can help you. But not only that, we have a full faculty support lab. And it's open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Come on in. Like, like I said at the start, we're really interested in what you're doing. And we're really interested in finding the right technology to help you. And this is really what it's all about. It comes back to how we work with people and what we really want to get out of our relationship with faculty. One last comment is at the end of the day today, we have a session on a new tool that we're uh, releasing today that's called MediaThread. It's based off of Vital. Vital was a, a video analysis tool that we've been using for courses for the last seven years. And it's now becoming something called MediaThread. If you're really interested in using video materials in a way where students can actually citate video and write online essays where they can actually reference video clips, to utilize all these types of content that we talked about today, I really encourage you to check out this MediaThread session. I think it will really be up your alley, especially if you're interested in video. So this is me. This is how you can reach me if you have any other questions. Thank you for coming by. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, enjoy lunch. <laughs>